When people say that there's a lot wrong with Dust Bowl, you probably think about its narrow corridors, single exit spawn rooms, and lengthy round times. But when I say that there's a lot wrong with Dust Bowl, I mean stuff like cracks, missing lighting, and shooting through doors. And I can guarantee that you don't know about most of these things, so let's go through everything I know to be wrong with Dust Bowl. And as always, I'll be providing solutions if I have any. Throughout TF2 maps, clip brushes are used to block player movement. You've probably heard of them as invisible walls, but they're not just used to stop you from getting out of the map, and we can see that with the staircase. Without any clip brushes, if I walk up and down it, my screen jitters because the transition to each step is instant, but if I add one long clip brush covering the top of each stair, then I've effectively turned the staircase into a ramp, so there are no more jitters. Dust Bowl does this, but with a caveat. The clip brush doesn't reach past the bottom stair to the floor, so your screen jitters on the first step. Whether this is a problem is ultimately a matter of opinion, since some people prefer having this little bump because it signals that they've walked onto the stairs. Either way, what makes these clip brushes problematic in Dust Bowl is their inconsistency. While most staircases are clipped off at the bottom step, some reach all the way down, others aren't aligned properly, and a few don't even have any clipping. It's quite bizarre seeing as Dust Bowl has been out for over 15 years, and fixing up each of these clip brushes would only take a few minutes. Valve would just need to decide whether they'd want the bottom step clipped. Now, stairs aren't the only place where we find bad clipping. Most of the buildings have these large blocky brushes that don't even line up with the roofs or walls. Just look at this ore shoot on the second stage. This clip brush doesn't come anywhere close to matching it. And just below it, these other ones, meant to block off the upper part of this cliff, create this overhang. This gets in the way of mobility classes, especially soldiers, who end up hitting their heads when rocket jumping. So while these brushes do prevent players from accessing restricted areas, they inadvertently block parts that shouldn't be. But hey, at least they keep all of the players where they're supposed to be, right? Wrong. Most of the clipping works as intended, but there are some places where it's missing, like the rocks around stage 2, and others where it actually creates new ledges. In most cases, this is because they aren't stretched high enough so you can stand on top of them. The most extreme example of this is at the final bend of stage 3. This clip brush exists to block off these electric boxes, but for some reason stops just short of this other one that runs along the top of the map, creating a gap that you can fit in. There are plenty more around the area, but I want to focus the end of this segment on this one because the top is sloped downward. You might think that this is the best way to add clipping, because if you try to run over it, you'll slip off. But because of some source spaghetti, you can pixel walk along the upper edge, and this kind of pixel walking can be found in other parts of the map too, including right around the corner above this trench. Fortunately, pixel walks can quickly be fixed by extending the brush through the walls so that players can't stand on the top edge. As for the rest of the clipping, it should just be redone altogether. Displacements are used in parts of the map that appear more organic, like the dirt ground and cliff walls. If I enter displacement mode in the face edit sheet, I can manipulate them in a variety of ways not possible with regular geometry. Most notably, I can select two adjacent displacements and sew them together so that there's no gap between them. I mention this because there are several cases in Dust Bowl where the displacements aren't sewn, the worst of which is right outside of Blue's first spawn. If I hide this support cluster, we see these huge cracks. The one at the bottom doesn't matter since it's hidden behind the supports, but the one at the top is visible even when I don't hide them. In fact, you can see it all the way back by the tunnels. If you stand above it, you can look through it into part of blue spawn and catch a glimpse of blue players running out. To fix this, you can select all of these displacements and sew them together. It'll cause a tiny part of the cliff wall to poke through the supports, but that can also be fixed by pushing that point of the displacement inwards. However, there is this one spot in blue's first spawn where sewing doesn't work, and that's because Valve stretched out one of the displacement's vertices to match up with this other one. Because of the way they position them, it's impossible to sew all three together. But by clipping the third one into two pieces and readjusting the vertex of the first one, we can sew everything together without much effort. The other hiccups with displacements aren't as game-breaking or cumbersome to fix, but sometimes you might notice that even though I've sewn them together, there's still a seam that runs between them. This happens when the two faces' texture shift and UV vectors are different. By making them the same, we eliminate the seam but sometimes seams can appear even when these values are the same, like in this corner right here where we see these two. 
This happens because the displacements alpha don't match along their boundaries. By selecting all of them and entering paint alpha mode, we can fix that in one click. But sometimes the displacements don't line up nicely and it isn't possible to paint away the seam. The only way to fix this is to split them up so that they form neat adjacent rectangles that line up nicely. The last kind of seam that occurs with displacements in this map happen between these two ground textures, Rock Ground 002 and Blend Rock Ground 004. They might look similar, and the blend texture does use the other one as its base, but there's one parameter in the Rock Ground 002 texture that makes it different than the version in the blend one, and that's this line that adds this Detail 004 texture. If I add the detail parameters to the blend one, the seam vanishes, but I get this weird striping effect with the alpha texture because of this other parameter called blend modulate texture. If I remove it, the issue goes away, but now a bunch of the rocks look faded and grainy. This might be why Valve left the detail parameter out of the blend texture, and perhaps they just didn't realize or care about the seam. The only easy way to fix this problem is to remove some of the parameters, like getting rid of the detail on the Rock Ground 002 texture so that it matches the blend one. On the topic of seams, a very bizarre one shows up along the top of this grass border overlay. And for those of you who don't know what an overlay is, it's basically just a texture that you can slap onto anything. I say it's bizarre because when I import the texture into Photoshop, there's no line. And when I turn it back into a VTF, the line's still there, but it's now grey, and I haven't figured out why or how to fix it. All I know is that the line along the top comes from the bottom of the texture, because if I shift it up a little bit, it disappears. If anybody knows what's going on here, let me know in the comments. Another problem with one of the other overlays is that it doesn't cover the entire side of this building like it's supposed to because it's only applied to a single brush face when this side of the building is made up of multiple. There's a good chance you haven't noticed this in-game because the overlay has its end fade distance set to 500 hammer units, meaning unless you're right up against it, you can't really see it in the first place. This can be fixed by adding the neighboring brush faces so that the overlay covers the entire wall and I'd also increase the fade distance so that you can actually see it from farther away. Moving on to the textures, there's this wood. What makes it problematic? This one called Wood Wall 02 has two problems. First, there are four planks in it that stretch across the entire texture. So if you have a long surface where the texture repeats, you end up with infinitely long planks. The second problem is that the texture isn't seamless, meaning at each point where it repeats, there's a seam that makes it look off-putting. The infinitely long planks can be eliminated by adding some edges to the texture, but fixing the seams is a bit more complicated. The traditional way of doing it is by overlapping the edges and blurring them, which typically works okay, but now that we have AI, we can use that to manipulate the texture along the edges to make it seamless without having to distort or blur anything. The last texture related thing I want to mention is something that I can't explain or fix. In game and in hammer, the metal grate texture on these smaller spawn gates is distorted at the top and bottom, but if I view the model in Half-Life Model Viewer or Blender, it isn't. And to make things more confusing, the larger variant, which is exactly the same, just wider, doesn't have this problem, so I don't know how one would even attempt to fix this. Since we're now talking about models, I want to bring up these lanterns. In Blue's first spawn, nearly all of them hang off of these tiny rusty nails, but some are straight up floating in the air. In fact, outside of Blue's spawn, there's only one other lantern in the entire map that's supported by a nail. Every other one magically floats in the air. I imagine Valve found it very tedious to place all those nails, so they just gave up after doing a few. Another issue with models is premature fadeout. Most of the props throughout the map have a start and end fade distance. When your distance from the prop is within the start, it appears normally. When you're between the start and end, it starts to fade. And when you go past the end, it disappears completely. This can be useful for decreasing the amount of things you have rendered when you're far away from them. But in Dust Bowl, nearly every prop is configured this way. And some of their fade out distances aren't high enough, which causes them to disappear in plain sight. Obviously, the distances in these cases should be increased, but to be honest, most of these props don't even need fade distances because they disappear when you leave the area anyway due to these boxes called viz leaves, which I won't explain in this video, but all you need to know is that they do a pretty good job at keeping the things you can't see out of render. Lighting in the Source engine isn't great, but there are some cases where it's worse than it needs to be. 
Back in the cave at Blue's first spawn, part of this minecart turns black when you approach it, and this wooden barrier that covers it is oriented backwards and also black. Starting with the minecart, the reason why it does this is because of something called Level of Detail, or LOD, which refers to how the poly count of models increases or decreases as you move towards or away from them. By loading up this minecart in Half-Life Model Viewer, we can see it's two other LOD versions that have a lower poly count. The purpose of having these is so that you don't have to render a bunch of detail when far away, since you can't really notice the difference anyway past a certain point. In this case, the edge of the model with the highest poly count stretches out a tiny bit farther than the other ones, which appears to be enough to block the light from this light spot entity from reaching it. It does reach the other two versions though, which is why it appears lit from farther away. The best way i found to fix this problem is to ignore surface normals in the props key values menu. This keeps the minecart lit no matter how close you are. I also experimented with shifting the light, moving the cart, and even using a special entity called Info Lighting to move its lighting origin somewhere else, which does work with other props, but in this case, none of these things worked well. As far as this wooden barrier goes, it should just be rotated 180 degrees so that it's oriented the right way. And this time, to keep it from being dark, I added this dim yellow light next to the lamp, which actually makes a lot of sense considering lanterns are supposed to shine light in all directions. Now not all lighting problems have to do with areas not receiving enough light. On the other side of the same cave, light bleeds in through the top for seemingly no reason. In Hammer, it seems as though no light should be coming in from anywhere because of this long no-draw brush, which in case you didn't know, is an invisible brush that blocks light but right next to it, we see a bit of this skybox texture poking through. This actually emits light, some of which bleeds through the edges of the displacement that runs along the top of the cave. All that Valve needs to do here is raise the bottom of the skybox up to the no draw. That way no light can reach the displacement. The other place where this happens is by the second point on the second stage. This rock cluster and building catch light spilling through the displacement because there isn't anything behind them to block it. By adding some no draw or block light brushes, this can also be fixed. But displacements sometimes act funky and don't block light even when they should. A great example of this is with the shack outside of Blue's first spawn, but it also happens outside of this building a little farther down. In both cases, some of the light from the inside seeps underneath the wall and shows up on the ground on the other side. There are two ways to fix this. The first is to separate the displacement into two pieces and resize them so that their edges meet the edge of the wall. This works well on thicker walls, but for thin ones like on this shack, it's not very practical. So instead, you can select all of the displacements and decrease their luxal scale to 4, which will sharpen the shadows along the edges and greatly reduce the amount of light bleeding through. The last lighting related problem I want to talk about is this storage room on the third stage. Despite having a hanging light that's turned on, no light comes out of it or the windows, so the room is nearly pitch black. By adding a couple of light entities, you can see how the room is transformed. The walls do look a bit funky because the texture isn't seamless, but by pressing the fit button in the face edit sheet, we can stretch it out so that it covers the entire wall. Before I wrap things up, I want to go over occluders. These brush entities hide models behind them, which can be useful for optimizing certain parts of the map where viz leaves don't work well. The problem with them in Dust Bowl is that there are three places where they're positioned too far from the wall, so when you shoot sticky bombs behind them, they disappear. One of these spots has hardly any effect on gameplay, but the other two definitely do. All that needs to be done here is move the occluders in more so that they don't leave any gap for stickies to hide behind. So those are most of the mistakes made by Valve when creating this map. I have several more here that I couldn't fit in the previous categories, so let's breeze through them. The first is this hole underneath Red's first spawn that you can see when crouched in front of the spawn door. Inspecting it in Hammer, we see that it's not actually a hole, but an exposed no-draw brush that reveals the 3D skybox. Since it's super dark down there, you can just add a simple brush in front of it, or retexture it to something else and the problem goes away. A similar one is this hole in the ground before the tunnels on the second stage, which is easier to see if you stand on top of this truss. Again, the culprit is a no-draw brush, but this time it's intersecting this other piece of geometry that is textured. All that Valve needs to do here is move the no-draw back a smidge. When this kind of overlapping occurs between two regular textures, you experience what's called Z-fighting, where both of the textures fight for dominance. 
There are a couple of places on Dust Bowl where this happens, but it's a lot rarer than I expected because there are a bunch of places where textures overlap. For some reason though, one usually ends up winning, so there's no Z fighting. Next, we have these block bullets brushes in one of the rocks on the first stage. I don't know why they're here, but they're not needed since the rock blocks bullets just fine. There are a few other block bullets brushes over at the third stage that are actually meant to block bullets from traveling over these roofs, but just like that clip brush I showed earlier, they don't stretch up high enough so it's possible to lob stickies over them, rendering them somewhat useless. Speaking of useless, there are a few entities throughout the map that literally are. Outside of this building on the second stage, there's a large no-build brush sitting on the roof. It doesn't need to be there since this area is already clipped off, but I'm almost positive it's there because of an old technique called the crouch jump exploit which allowed engineers to build teleporters through thin ceilings. Another such spot with these funk no-build brushes is behind these windows on the third stage. Just like before, they're not necessary because they're already covered by clip brushes, so I presume these were also added upon the discovery of an exploit. Next, we have this door. What I didn't mention in my video about TF2's door problem is that this funk door isn't aligned with the grid, which creates this tiny gap on the side that you can shoot through. However this happened, it can be fixed by snapping the door onto the grid. I talked a lot more about this door and others in my previous video, so check it out if you're interested. Now this door isn't the only thing that's misaligned. This wooden truss on the first stage is off-center by two units, apparent by this tiny gap and extrusion on the sides. By shifting it over, we can align it perfectly with the building. The last problem of this video is the first control point on stage 2. The trigger capture area is positioned low enough to the floor that you can reach it from underneath by crouch jumping. I made an entire short about this problem, which I'll also have linked in the description. So that covers just about everything wrong with Dust Bowl. There are a few other small things here and there that could be improved, but this video is already long enough and I don't want to bore you. So thank you for watching, this is LED, switching off.